Hello and welcome to our webinar today. Really lovely to see you here. My name is Jackie Short. I'm the Director of Sydney Centre for Creative Change and I'd like to warmly welcome you to our Holding Space webinar number 37 today. This webinar is about listening with a receptive mind and my good friend and colleague Matthew Evans is going to be presenting for us. He's already done one of these three webinars so if you're interested in his work really keen to um, have a look at his previous recording as well, which is on our website. Again, warm welcome to everybody. I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands that I come to you from today, the Eora people of the Gadigal Nation, and pay our collective respects to Indigenous elders past, present and emerging around the wide land that we might find ourselves on today. So warm welcome one and all. This is going to be recorded, but the breakout room isn't recorded. So whatever you discuss with your partner in the small groups is just between the two of you, but we will ask you to invite a few people to perhaps reflect on some of that sharing and the experience when you come back from your breakout room. But uh, this will be recorded and the recording will be available to uh, you in the future and to anyone who wasn't able to make it here today. If you want to share that recording link with anyone, you're more than welcome to as well. So that will be in a couple of weeks. Um, this is recorded now. I'll edit this recording in a couple of weeks and I'll send you an email when the link is available. Matthew is a psychologist and a spiritual director who has worked in both public and private clinics for more than 20 years. His counselling strengths are in treating anxiety, depression and stress, as well as relationship problems. And he tailors his treatment to address the unique problems of each person in order to tap into their own resourcefulness and common sense. Matthew, as you will see if you haven't yet met him, has a warm, empathic, approachable manner and creates a safe, non-judgmental environment for confidential disclosures. So I would like now to welcome Matthew and to hand over to you for the presentation today. Welcome everyone. Um, it's great to see so many uh, here and uh, it's lovely to be invited back. And um, so I, um, I'll probably be take, tackling this listening question, which um, I, I know most of you are therapists and of one sort or another. Um, it's your stock and trade. And, and generally people, uh, <laughs> especially therapists, um, you know, I've been a psychologist for over, you know, 24 years now, I think. And um, yeah, we all think we're pretty good listeners, but often that's not the case. And we tend to overestimate our listening ability. And so, you know, maybe you'll be invited to perhaps uh, think again and, uh, you know, just have a, um, a new or fresh look at listening, hopefully. That, that, that would be one of my goals. But more formal goals would be just to... Um, you know, um, reflect on sort of deep listening, or as I said, uh, receptive listening, reflective listening, or listening with a contemplative mind. Um, uh, in a sense, listening with a receptive mind is, is what we're going to be exploring. And, um, and I'll make a distinction between um, that sort of mind and our normal active mind. And, and the active mind is when we listen with our intellects, you know, so, um, and we're processing with our intellect, you know, it's, sort of, it's a different, it's a great processing tool, this thing called the intellect. And, uh, but it is very active, you know, it engages with the material, the content of what we're hearing in a very active way. Um, it tends to be analytical, it tends to be evaluative, it tends to be discerning, it tends to be critiquing, and it's run through a lot of fil filters, you know, like, um, you know, we can't uh, turn it off a lot of the time, you know, like it's running, it's running, it's running, it's the default setting. Um, you know, all of the therapists here, I'm sure I've done a lot of training and, and you know, what we're often trained in is this, this intellectual ability, this um, sort of a highly um, technical, you know, sort of cognitive ability where we do a lot of pattern matching, you know, with um, what we're seeing in front of us with the various um, sort of diagnoses or assessments, you know, that we sort of think of. But I'm actually not going to be, you know, you know all that sort of stuff and it's got its place. You know, we have to work within a, um, a medical or quasi-medical model at times that requires some, you know, type of assessment, sometimes more informal. 
And so we can do that pattern matching, but that, that's not the sort of stuff I'm interested in, in exploring today. Um, I'm wanting to explore this deep listening, you know, and see how we can access a more receptive mind, a more reflective mind, both our own and, and the person we're listening to, our client or, um, or the family or whoever. So that's, that's what I'll be inviting you into uh, first up. You know, just to, to listen, if you could, as best you can, with the, um, the intellect, if you like, the analytical mind turned down, not intellectualizing so much. Um, <laughs> I might even suggest, you know, like, don't worry about taking notes so much. You no, know, because what I'd like um, people to be able to listen to with is a quiet mind. And what do I mean by that? A mind that's not so much interested in analysis. Um, it's not so tied up with expectation and in comparing what I'm saying to all the other um, trainings you've done on listening. You know, the, the Buddhists have got a nice term, they call it the beginner's mind. Um, it's sort of listen, listening like you might listen to a favourite piece of music. You know, you just sort of settle in and, um, and just uh, get into that more contemplative space, so to speak. So as I said, you know, there these two modes that we have, you know, in our, our minds, there's many modes, I guess, but two, two that I'm pointing to. One is the receptive mode um, and then, then the active mode. And why, why I think it's so useful to get used to this style of listening is because it helps, when we're listening in a reflective mode, it helps us to settle down and it also helps our clients to settle down. Um, you know, sometimes we come into sessions that are very tight, you know, with a very tight mind. And, and if we can listen with a quieter mind, you know, we settle down. And also our clients come in into sessions often with very tight mind, very uptight, very, you know, their, their problems are glued to their eyeballs, they're, they're up close and personal with whatever the presenting issue is. And, um, and sometimes it doesn't really um, sort of, draw out the best sort of uh, best quality thinking um, about their problems in a session. So in, in this listening with this open hearted way that I'm trying to point to, um, we can relax ourselves and we can start to help our clients settle down as well, because they'll pick up that energy, that more relaxed, more reflective way of listening. Um, and we could sort of talk about that, that really active mode takes things very personal. It's very personal mind. It's, it's tied up with our egoic self and even more so our persona, you know, how we want to present and, and present ourselves to the world. So um, it, uh, it's got its place. We have to prepare our face to meet the faces we meet, as a poet once said. But, um, but you know, in the, um, in the process of therapy, we're, we're trying to, get beyond the persona, get beyond the face. You know, the good therapy is when people feel safe enough um, to be a bit vulnerable and they'll, they'll drop the persona and, and start exploring those deeper, more vulnerable feelings that, uh, you know, it's almost like there's a wound there that they, they're very careful to, not to show to the world because they're not safe, you know? And so we, we try and create a very safe, secure space by by listening in this way. It's almost like the name of this podcast or webinar series. It's about holding space. You know, that's, that's the sort of listening that I'll be pointing to. And we know it has a big impact on the listener. You know, like, so if we listen with that analytical, with that judgment, and, you know, even worse, we start, you know, um, questioning what they're saying and maybe even challenging them. You know, we're, we're, we're guaranteed to start shutting them down and, and draw out a defensive mode in the client. And, uh, and so we create insecurity in the client that way, often without meaning. Um, and we start seeing them shut down, withdraw, and you know, that can be picked up by their energy, their vibe, um, by their, their nonverbal language as well, as well as how they're, they're saying, you know, but we're, we're trying to listen in such a way where we're not really trying to do that, obviously, not to get people to put up walls and barriers, but to open up, to slowly feel comfortable enough to share their deeper thoughts, their more vulnerable feelings, and, uh, and also 
their deeper wisdom too. That's accessible through this wider type of listening. So I'm just going to, we are just doing a trial before the session and hopefully I've learned the, the skill of sharing the screen this time when we're going live. I'm going to share um, what I'm pointing to with the help of Michael Looney, the, the cartoonist, because he talks about this in a cartoon I read recently and um, I'll sort of unpack pack it a little bit because it's really uh, a very nice cartoon. And, uh, I'll just say it to make it bigger. And so Michael, um, you know, he's got a beautiful image there and he talks about the room. Um, and I'll read it. Sick of reading the room, go outside and read the garden, read the birds and the moon, read the tea leaves in your cup, read the stars, feel the clouds, read the palm of your hand, Read the eyes of a child. Watch the ants as they work. Touch the truth in the soil. Listen to the thunder and the rain. Read a poem. Stay away from the room. Reading the room is a waste of life. It will make you sick. <laughs> uh, and um, I guess... Uh, Mike Lunig is always one for the big statements and, uh, you know, it's a bit uh, hyperbolic or, you know, it's uh, a big statement at the end. Um, but he's sort of pointing to something that, you know, th this deeper feeling for life is gained through a different type of receptive mode. The one I'm pointing to called deep listening or receptive listening or listening with a contemplative mind. And, um, you could take um, the word read out and almost the, in all that in all those lines of the poem and and write you know you know listen to the birds and the moon you know listen to the garden listen to the stars feel the clouds you know it's a, again the receptive mode you know and in a sense there's a lovely line there too listen to the thunder and the rain so it's sort of this sense I'll be inviting you to maybe practice this sort of listening, you know, even to my presentation. And then when, when we get into an exercise, listen to each other, like you'd listen to rain, like you'd listen to thunder, like you'd listen in a very receptive way, you know, to a child, you know, not, not so caught up in the content, but listening um, for the deeper feelings that I, I've been pointing to. So that, that's, I, I thought, um, the, a nice pointer for what I'm trying to share. So I'll stop sharing there. Um, and uh, and so the thing I will be looking at too is um, maybe the benefits of contemplative listening or this reflective listening, um, and maybe the barriers, um, and and also a few how tos before we give it a go ourselves. Um, so, you know, in, you know, about 24 years or so, I've been working with individuals and couples, families and so on. In many backgrounds, it's, it's funny, I, sometimes I reflect on, you know, why do some really do well in therapy and others don't do so well? And obviously I'm a common denominator in some of that. But I, I know for my part, it, it is, you know, sometimes my quality of listening isn't the greatest and sometimes it's a lot better. But I'd also say, you know, there's something in the client. It's not, it's not the smartest and the most educated who necessarily do better in therapy or whatever. Get, um, it's, I often find it's the ones who have the courage to be more open and to share more deeply and their, those raw feelings, their, their wounds, so to speak, their vulnerabilities to go beyond that persona, you know, have the courage. And, and that um, I, I'm mostly, mostly through the 20 four years or something, I've been um, counselling people, it's by mostly they're men and, and men, I think Australian men in particular, they still feel a, quite a stigma about coming to therapy, not all, but um, I find a lot of people, I, I work in Leichhardt, it's a very middle Australia, but it's, it's very diverse, the backgrounds, people from Mediterranean backgrounds, quite a bit, and 
and people in the trades, professional people, people, um, working people, like a whole range. And, and couples and families I occasionally see as well, less so these days. But, you know, it's again that willingness to um, start to bear those things that they don't necessarily bear to other people. And so it's, uh, you know, it's a real honour to, um, to hold space for people like that who are willing to, to open up. And so I guess um, you know, the, the benefits, I would say then, you know, if, that, if that's a really helpful thing, you know, to make a good connection with people such that they feel secure and safe enough to start sharing at a deeper level, um, often things that they haven't shared anywhere else, well, what's going to help them get there is often this, um, this very receptive type of listening that I'm pointing to. And I also think it's really helpful because it'll actually help them get in touch with their own, you know, deeper feelings and deeper intuition, their own common sense. Um, you know, uh, in, in spiritual direction, sometimes I, I'm working with people who, uh, you know, who have a sense of... Um, God guiding them in their lives, you know, this, this inner voice, you know, and so and, and people without any spirituality or without any religion, they often um, have that same sense too, you know, so it's not, um, it's not like there's a, a big division between uh, spiritual direction and, you know, psychological counselling. Often people are looking for, um, you know, answers, you know, and deeper answers and some guidance, inner guidance. And, you know, a lot of people coming to therapy, they, you know, when it boils down to, they often want better relations. You could almost say three things, better relations, feel more at peace, feel happier in their lives. You know, they're, they're the basic things. And I think this type of listening helps with all those sort of things. And you know, there's often more specific things. But, um, you know, I think the benefit of one of these listening is, you know, it sort of, it helps us park our intellect. You know, it gets it out of the way a bit so we can see a bit deeper. You know, it, it helps um, our intellect to settle down a little bit, such that our deeper wisdom kicks in, you know, this deeper knowing that um, I think everyone has, you know, like um, I'm very fond of, um, I, was, I was into Jungian psychology in, in the early years of my career. And uh, <laughs> I mean, I still love Jung very much, but, you know, I never went the track of becoming a Jungian analyst. It, it seemed a bit... Um, not, not my path, so to speak. But, you know, there, there's a quote, um, that, no, not a quote, but there's famous said across the counselling room in his home in, in Latin, inscribed in Latin was a, a phrase, you know, and it was uh, called or not called, you know, invoked or not invoked, God is always present. And, you know, you, you mightn't like the God word, but uh, what I, I actually like about that is, you know, there's some there's some sort of mystery or some sort of sacredness or some sort of, I don't know what to call it exactly, but some sort of um, um, magic almost that happens when people um, open their hearts to you and, and reveal something um, uh, highly, uh, I don't know, you know, sort of personal and, uh, and you know, and, and to meet that with a similarly, um, almost a reverence or sacredness is, is, is lovely. And I think this sort of listening when those moments arise allow us to do that, to, to open to that, uh, almost the, the mystery of that moment, the sacredness of that, that moment. So it can help us. This is a benefit, I guess, I'm pointing, connect deeply with others, you know, rather than the opposite of this deep listening is this surface listening. And, you know, often therapy does stay up there, you know, just on the surface with the persona and, you know, how do I have a better ego in the world and how do I have a, a shinier, brighter persona, you know, a better, um, I don't know, whatever it is, <laughs> the six, there's so many six steps to everything, isn't it? But I, I, I sort of sometimes I'm asked with those, for those strategies and those six steps. <laughs> and I often, I say, oh, you know, I'm sure there's really good books and there are, you know, self-help um, shells, you know, heave with new volumes all the time. But I actually think, you know, the thing about this deeper listening I'm trying to point to is they have a, their own wisdom on all this. You know, they don't need to do this endless research. And I find people are, are doing that all the time on their various um, devices and platforms and 
and books. But I, I actually think um, we can point them in the direction of their own deeper understanding, their own uh, wisdom, their own common sense that um, lives within them. So I do think um, you know they they've got some really be good benefits. Um, and, and it's not to say we, you know, I'm putting the intellect down. The intellect is still going to be there and it's still very useful. Um, uh, but we don't have to have it running the show the whole time, you know. Uh, uh, so um, hey, one, one final benefit before sort of moving on a little bit is, um, is this idea of, um, you know, that... You know, we actually, we get into a more reflective mode ourselves, but somehow that has the effect of, as I say, drawing the speaker out such that they become more reflective. We can somehow draw just by virtue of this holding space of slowing down ourselves um, into a space where they have some new thoughts, they have some deeper insights, they have some fresh thinking, you know, some. They can surprise themselves, you know, a little bit of a confusion comes on across their face and they have a little aha moment and they sort of say, oh, something new occurred to me. It's, it's lovely to, win, you know, to see that light bulb go on in the therapy session, you know. It's sort of like, to my mind, that's, that's a real benefit of this type of listening, you know, where somehow we've helped them draw from their own well of being, you know, their own well-being, you know, that sort of sense of you know, that, that was there, their own knowing, you know, because I, I do think, you know, people present problems, that's the, almost the, the model, but they, they also have answers within them. And, um, but often, I can't remember who said it, but, you know, that at a different level of consciousness, you know, that, that problems people present can't be solved at that same level of consciousness. So what I'm pointing to by this deeper listening is to help them, um, have a more spacious, more um, open uh, level of consciousness, you know, like move to a high level or a more expanded level of consciousness, so to speak. So that, that, that's, the, that's a, a benefit, I would say, as well. Um, so uh, I'm going to, you know, sort of mention that, um, you know, the, you know, the barrier, one of the main barriers to the um, to listening deeply and, and sort of talk about maybe some how-tos. It's, it's, it's a hard thing to talk about how-tos in this because it's not, not a technique as much. It's more like an understanding or it's more like a stance. And I say listening with a contemplative mind, it's like a contemplative stance. It's like an open-hearted stance, just like that stance in that poem of Looney, you know. Um, stop reading the room you know like it's funny you know we, we often think of the reading the room as a, a positive thing you know as getting the being emotionally intelligent or something you know picking up on things and so well, there is that but I think he's sort of talking about reading the room like working the room like using that analytical uh, strategic mind in the calculating one you know to get some advantage you know um, so I think um He's pointing to this more contemplative stance, you know, and, and so talking about how to's is um, I'll, 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 I'd rather talk about the point, some pointers in this, you know, some, some little um, leading strings that could help us uh, look in this direction or point in this direction. Um, and, and maybe the th first thing is just the barrier to it, you know, like, <laughs> I wish I was a better model for this, but I was rushing around this morning <laughs> before the session. <laughs> and because there's some usual unexpected things come up. And so, but, you know, usually, um, you know, I find um, it's good to give it a bit, of, a bit of time, you know, just to prepare yourself to, to listen in this way, you know, almost set an intention. Because, you know, what we're trying to bring to our listening is like, I deliberately you know sort of sat on the couch today rather than at the table because I wanted to listen you know even to model somehow this listening with a more relaxed mind you know so rather than the couch, or sitting on the couch as um, I thought it's like that but it's also um it's like listening with a quieter mind not with a busy mind that's the one of the biggest barriers you know like um 
And what do I mean by the busy mind? Well, the intellect, you know, is busy. You know, it's it's um, it's a great uh, processor. The intellect, you know, this and it'll. But what what is it doing? You know, the intellect. If it's at the forefront of our listening, you know, it's evaluating, it's analyzing. You know, you know, it's interested in things like ranking. You know, like um, you know, hierarchies. You know, categories. You know, it's interested in. Uh, it does a lot of work, you know, and it's, it churns, you know, like a, like a really fast processor. And um, people will feel that too, you know, if your, your mind's super busy and so on and so forth. So um, what, I, what I'm suggesting is, you know, that we somehow quieten the mind. We relax our own minds, you know. We, um, you know, the metaphor that's often used for that, it's a nice one, is, you know, the snow globe, you know. And so uh, when our mind's really busy, you know, it's, a, it's like that snow globe when we're, I wish I had a snow globe to illustrate, but it's, uh, you know, it's, it's all the silt or the snow and you can't see the scene, you know. But when there's, you know, when the mind's quieter, you can see whatever the scene is, you know, the, the tropical fish or the, the snow scene or whatever it is that, that you know, those you know, toys have. So that, that's what the busy mind does. But if we can park that busy mind, we can't necessarily turn up, but park it, not attend to it a much, you know, it can be running in the background, so to speak. Um, but we can settle, our minds will settle, and, and that'll have a settling effect on, on, our, on the client too. Um, and so, you know, we, we listen not with that sped up mind, but more a relaxed mind. So it's, I guess there's a learning in that, you know, having an appreciation for, you know, slowing the mind down, allowing it to be a bit calmer, a bit clearer, you know, and, you know, that, that brings possibilities for us and also for the client, you know, when, when that happens, you know, like there's a gaps in our thinking, something new can come through. A sped up mind has less, less, um, choice you know it, it only knows what it knows you know it, it's got the memories but it's, it doesn't really know um, a lot that's new and fresh so um, and the quieter mind slowing down <laughs> a little bit has benefits as I said before in terms of connection with the other we have more you know often compassion we're, we're more impacted by the other um you know we we you know we sometimes people you know um leave therapists because they don't feel heard you know it's a big thing you know they don't feel that they got the they were got so to by by the therapist you know so um but so i think this has got that benefit for that you know being impacted by the client you know having compassion for the client a real heartfelt compassion you know you feel what they're up against, you know, what, what's, what's, um, what's it like to be in their lives and so on, you know, so you get that sense. And I think it's like, you know, using the metaphor of this um, computing, you know, the, the faster our mind um, races, the less bandwidth we have, you know, we, 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 we don't have that capacity, you know, things happen in therapy and we, and things, you know, come out, expect, we can, with more bandwidth, we can take that in our stride, you know. Um, we lose our way a little bit, you know, we, we can pick up. Um, um, so I think so there, there are a few more thought, thoughts about it. I'm just um, aware um, that, you know, we, we have been talking for a while and um, we'll break to do an exercise in a little while. But I'll just give you a few more little thoughts about um, what I'd uh, say that this listening is about to listening. Like one thing I've never liked about cognitive behavioral therapy is they have this clinical expert sort of model. I hope they don't emphasize that as much as I used to years ago when I first learned it, but I don't like that thing of a person setting themselves up as the clinical expert, you know, and, and downloading the clinician's wisdom to the client, you know. Um, I don't think that's helpful. So I think. And you know, anyone in Jackie school <laughs> wouldn't be uh, seeing that as helpful either, I guess. So um, 
but I do think it's good to emphasize that we have a healthy, really healthy respect, human respect for the client. You know, we set a warm, friendly tone. We don't judge. We come alongside them. We're, we're, we're their peer, you know, and we're in service to them of, of what they want from their therapy. And so I, I think it's very really unhelpful to disagree with a client who tends to shut them down, as I said, and, and then we're just defending our positions and we've just got a defensive client now. So it's all that, um, like I said, creating the safe space so that those more tender, vulnerable feelings can show through. And another metaphor I like is that idea of um, somehow, well, how could you say, you know, the, the sifting the gold in the pan, you know, the, you know, the, how the Tsafal and Ibathus and so on, there's these people go down the river and they have these gold panning and they sift, they're looking for those nuggets of gold. And, you know, they're sifting through that. And so it's trying to see what's valuable to the client, you know, what's, what's meaningful and valuable to them. And so, you know, we discard the sand and the grit and we get to the core, the, you know, the deeper um, thing of value beyond, beyond the surface, beyond the persona, to the goal, to hit the mother load, so to speak. And so, again, um, we're trying to get the client to be in a more reflective mode, in a sense. And um, so I guess there, there, I can think of an example, just a um, new client I had last week that comes to mind and um, where, uh, well, there's a couple of examples, one the week before too, a couple. But the one last week just comes to mind is this chappy who was, um, he's a bar manager and restaurant manager in, in the inner west somewhere. And, and he came uh, uh, very cool to <laughs> Um, you know, and, you know, he had his persona up, was, you know, he's late thirties and he's got this restaurant and it's in the strip and it's all, and um, but what was he up against? Like, you know, it's interesting in the listening, he, he revealed there, yeah, he sort of, just to get through a shift, you know, um, he saw his whole uh, owning the show and running the show, his front of house, you know, he was running the bar and whatnot, there was a restaurant at the back or something. He was needing to use six or seven shots, you know, you know, pretty, pretty a lot of alcohol just to get through the ship because he felt so pressured by the whole show. And um, that's sort of what he was up against and that came out. And, um, and you know, listening more deeply, you know, like we got to reflect sort of place and he sort of saw, yeah, it was, you know, he saw his, his work as, it was all on him for it to, to go. And so he was trying too hard. He was under enormous pressure. And, um, and I guess, um, you know, we, I, I wondered with him about that, you know, because I, I remember when I was a student many years ago, I worked in that space, I worked in hospitality and even ran a bar in the rocks for a couple of years, actually, as a student. And, and I didn't feel it as pressured. I, but, um, and so we, you know, we were able to, you know, met him as a peer and understand. And, and like, I just sort of saw, we talked about, you know, performance then versus presence. And so um, that was a lovely chap. And I thought he could just come across as himself more. He didn't have to be constantly pushing himself to perform, be all singing, all dancing, having to do everything. And so he could come and quiet down. And he saw that himself, that he was putting himself under enormous pressure. And that came from his own sort of insights, you know, so, and that he could see that, you know, like um, he was overthinking the whole thing, you know, like overanalyzing, his mind was racing. And, and so that's why he had to keep knocking those shots back, you know, just to get through it. And so um, that, that, that's an example, I guess, you know, both the, in a sense that peerness, I was able to, you know, establish a rapport with this guy, you know, like I don't look the coolest dude. <laughs> <laughs> like in, in you know but but because I'd worked in that space and I know some of the pressures and I could really he had a lovely metaphor he said you know it's a cruel mistress you know that's how I described his his workplace it's really interesting and like I really felt what he was up against it hit me up this is how he sees it it's a cruel mistress you know it's hard and uh yeah so we had a meeting of minds around that and uh, able to uh, you know see a way to maybe see it differently, that he could be in that space in a more relaxed way and still respond to the needs of um, running a bar 
in a, a restaurant uh, and so on. So um, that, that's probably all I've got to say about the listening. We're going to move into um, uh, a, uh, a listening exercise. And, um, and Jackie's going to divide you into pairs in a moment. But I'll just give you the exercise. Uh, and, and maybe just to quickly recap, um, you know, we're going to listen as best we can with a relaxed mind. Um, there's a, you know, a spiritual saying, you know, that says, listen with the ear of your heart. It's very nice. It's a lovely saying. So that's what, just another pointer. It's like, listen from here from the heart space, rather from the, you know, the head space, the intellect, you know, just see if you can quieten that down and listen from here. Listen like you're listening to the rain. Listen beyond the words to that deeper feeling. Uh, you know, and, and listen for those deeper feelings there, you know, with that quieter, quieter mind and so on. And so that's what I thought the exercise we could do. And, and what I suggest is we'll have, um, we'll have turns five minutes each, five minutes, uh, one person being the listener, and then five minutes, the other person being the listener. And I'd really ask you, you know, uh, to not, not speak at all. Um, maybe if you can, and I might actually just do before we go into it, just do a, like a one or two minute little uh, making space, you know, for, for a quiet quiet mind, you know, where we could uh, be a bit freer from distractions. And so um, on Zoom, we, we can't sit facing each other, but I'd like you to, you know, just to tune in with each other. And um, the topic can be anything of your choice, you know, but it, it'll be five minutes each. I don't know if Jackie will do a timer or something like that. And uh, she will. <laughs> so, um, so five minutes each. And then five minutes at the end, you could just do the debrief. And so you just choose uh, something you're a bit curious about or interested in and, and, and not too intense, mild to mid-level issue um, that you can, um, perhaps something that's bothering you. Um, it doesn't have to be a big thing, as I say, maybe an issue at work or something with a friend or whatever it might be. Um, and so the first one, person A just shares what's on their mind. And the listener is just going to listen. And I'm going to ask the listener um, to not, um, not speak at all. Your role is sim simply sit and listen and give that full undivided attention that I've been speaking to. And the, the, the job of the listener is just to notice what's happening in their own thinking while the speaker is talking. And so I want you to be, be aware of some of those filters that I've been speaking to that pass through your mind. So, um, and so what, one example might be, you know, this feels really uncomfortable to look at someone for so long and not say anything, or it might be a distraction. Oh, what's for dinner tonight? And maybe I could pick up something on the way home, or I wonder what the weather's going to be doing on the weekend. It's a big issue. <laughs> um, and you could, you know, you could be thinking, oh, it's really hard not to say anything. How could I fix this? You know, I know I can fix this. And or you know, you might be aware of my mind's wandering so much. Uh, or you might be thinking they're making such a big deal of it that they should just, you know, take a chill pill or something. Whatever it's going, just notice what's going on. So, um, and so then when your time's up, um, you can just say that noticing because I think you could share at the end because it, I really only want 15 minutes for this session. So, you know, just to maybe take a note and then it's your turn. And then at the end, when the other person's had the uh, opportunity to, uh, to listen, maybe in that five minutes where you, you know, you obviously swap roles and the other person listens now and they notice what's going through their minds, what their filters are doing with. And so, and then between you, you can just sort of say, you know, reflect together. And what, what did you notice? What did you learn? How did you... Uh, did you find you had filters, those sort of filters that, you know, was the intellectual mind, the analytical mind hard at work, was it? And, um, and you could also reflect on how it was to be the speaker with the, someone's full attention. 
and what occurred to you as you were speaking? Did you notice anything shift or move? So they're the questions for the debrief, you know, and I know it's um, you, but you know, what anything that comes up for you that seems salient, seems to um, be of value would be good, you know? So hopefully that's clear. Um, uh, and uh, as I say, I'll just do a one minute little um, uh, reflection to, to get us into that quieter mind that we can listen, um, as the old saying goes, you know, with the ear of our heart, with, with this more open hearted listening. Um, and so, you know, you might want to have your eyes downcast or, or closed. And um, um, to just invite you to uh, yeah, come into the moment and just feel your body sitting here on the chair. Let me feel your breath. Feel the in and the out of the breath. And then I just kind of invite you to have a slightly longer out breath. And really, you know, sink into the chair you're sitting on. Feel the support of the chair. See if you can just drop your shoulders if they're a bit raised. And soften your, your face. Soften your eyes. And I just encourage you just to... Um, Have a, a, a very slight smile, a little half smile on your face, like a Buddha smile or a Mona Lisa smile. Just one of those very little smiles on your face. Just the, turn the corners of your mouth just upwards ever so slightly. Just notice the feeling of that smile, that very slight smile on your face. And then if you can, just in your mind's eye, just take that smile and feel what it feels like on the inside of your mouth, so to speak. You know, feel it a bit deeper, that smile. Because I want you to take that smile now into your mind. Just imagine a smile across your forehead somehow. You know, just however you might imagine that. Just calming the mind. Very calm smile, smile of equanimity, so to speak. You know, everything's okay, everything's pretty neutral. Just that smile, relaxed smile. And, uh, and then, uh, then the other part, which is the final part, just to take that smile one step further and just feel that smile in your heart, feel that smile in your chest. And, uh, just have that smile going across your chest. And uh, that would be uh, yeah, what I'd invite you to just sit with that for a, a minute. Smile in your, on your mouth, smile on your mind, and a smile in your chest. And again, breathe deeply, and then, then I'll invite Jackie to uh, put you into the breakout groups. Thank you. <clears throat> Welcome back, everybody. Welcome back. Lovely to see you here. Would anybody like to reflect a little on what that exercise was like to do as either the speaker or the listener? If you'd put your hand up, I'd like to invite a couple of people to share some reflections. Uh, Sally, thanks. Hi, everyone. I found that um, a really nice... Um, exercise to do, uh, again, just to get you into that um, sort of observer of what's happening in your mind. And for our uh, Mel and Mai's um, little, little workout that we did, what came up was a lot of comparing, my comparing mind, um, my judging mind, and um, little triggers into frustration, like a joint frustration on the topic. Um, and again, 
probably a lot more, but that's that's the, the stuff that I picked up on. Um, and just to be able to also recognise um, as when I was the talker, recognise that some of the key benefits I received from just being listened to was really attuning to the body language of the person in front of me um, and how that linked me to keep going rather than just to, to cut off because I, I didn't get any feedback. Thanks, Helen. That, that was quite new. Yeah, yeah, great. Thanks for those reflections. Anybody else want to share what that was like for them? Uh, Lisa, thanks. I found um, when I had to listen, I wanted to ask questions. So I wanted to, you know, and empathise with, with, with Lena. So I had to really, that was a little bit of a struggle to like sit back and just try and receive it rather than, you know, going to doing something. And when I was, when she was listening to me, I found it just gave me so much space to keep going, like where there was end, there was still more time so it could go to that deeper level of what this means to me, which we talked about afterwards, which reminded me of how good that is for the clients where, you know, when we doubt that we need to do more for them. Great. Great reflections. Thank you, Lisa. I appreciate that. I know there were a few others with their hands up before and um, I would like to hear from lots of people. Unfortunately, with the time, um, it's a little bit more challenging. If there's any feedback that you'd like to reflect on to share with others, feel free to please put it into the chat. But I also wanted to open up to any questions that you might have of Matthew. He's only going to be with us for a few more minutes today and is, has some final reflections he'd like to share with us. But does anyone have anything you'd like to ask directly of Matthew? Uh, Sue Kim, thanks. Just get you to unmute first. Okay, I'd like to check with um, Matthew because it's something that I do draw from, but I, I would like to hear whether it's something that is actually helpful. Um, the use of metaphors, imageries, um, as you're listening to the client. Um, yeah. You want to say a little bit more, Sue Kim? I, I um, drawing from imageries and um, metaphors, um, because you talk about listening to the client. Yeah. And sometimes when you're listening to the client, you hear certain things and yeah. you, you, you have, sometimes have a sense of feel of a certain imagery. Yeah. Can you draw from that um, yeah. to yeah. use? I that, yeah, is, that, is it their image or your image or both? That, um, sometimes it's both. But yeah, sometimes yeah. it's this, but you, yeah. I, when I'm listening, I actually sense an imagery that I think yeah. is helpful. So I bring it up. I know of, of, of a few times where they've said, my goodness, that is just what I, just yeah. that's what I need. But I just wanted yeah. to be sure. Yeah. No, how... it's, it's great. I, I think it's exactly what I'm pointing to. That's my sense that, that it's, you know, because it's that, the images, their metaphors, their analogy, it's beyond words, isn't it? It's getting to that non-conceptual mind, you know, that deeper wisdom, yours and theirs, and, and checking it out with them. You know, it's a beautiful thing. And, and uh, the other example I was thinking earlier, you know, when I shared the guy in the bar and so on, but it was a couple and, and they were having marital trouble and, and uh, they came up with their own metaphors. And the, the guy, you know, he, his was feel the love. He, he was sort of more uh, on the Aspie sort of side of things, very engineering oriented. And, and she was a super busy, high functioning sort of person and, and hers was make the space. And yeah, they're just beautiful metaphors they came up with in, when they got into that deeper place, um, that popped up for them and, and it touched them, you know, that they were gonna go forward and try and do that in their relationship. So it's exactly what I'm saying. And because you're listening with that more curious and neutral mind, that they will pop up these images, these metaphors and, and just to tentatively see, you know, um, offer that to them. I think it's a beautiful thing, Silly. Yeah, it's something you do. And I think it, we, we, we can all do that. And it, it gets us into that deeper place of knowing, you know, beyond the intellect, because it's beyond words, those, their yeah. images, as you say, and they're, they're often, they're often poetic, you know, just like that poem we started with, you know, where, you know, like that. And I thought to finish with a poem as well, because, you know, they're, 
poetry comes from that place too. And so, so does this metaphor, this images, like I say, and that's, so I don't know many of you are sand play people and, and play therapists and art therapists, you know, that's beyond words too, so much of that too. And I, I think it's touching that same space I'm pointing to, you know, that, that very generative, um, I don't know, you know, very creative space, their own knowing and wisdom, the aha moments come more thick and fast when you can get there. So I think it's a lovely thing to offer. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Matthew, I, I might invite you, if you wouldn't mind, to do your wrapping up. And okay. I know you have a, a lovely poem you'd like to read to us yes. as well. Sure. Uh, <laughs> well, I just thought the conclusion is sometimes good. You know, they, what was it, another poet said, you know, best to end with a bang, not a whimper. So <laughs> this might not be a bang, but hopefully it won't be a whimper anyway. But um, so I've been pointing to this sort of type of listening, which is beyond you know, exchanging content, facts, information, the intellect. Um, but sometimes uh, when we get that, and so maybe people notice that sometimes when we listen, we're just waiting our turn to speak. You know, we don't want that sort of listening. There's this other sort of listening, you know, that um, where there's more of a closeness, more of an understanding, it grows. And, and when we're touched by the spirit of another, um, and that's when we have this... Uh, listening where there's meeting of hearts and minds, so to speak. And we've all got that ability, you know, and you've just been doing it now, I can, I can hear, you know. Uh, and we just, perhaps we need to cultivate it more, give space for it more, but it's there within all of us. Um, and, um, and when we do activate that, that listening with a more receptive mind, a more reflective mind, um, you know, it, Closeness and understanding grows, you know, in the in the counselling room or even in our relationships broadly. And, you know, we're touched by the other and they're touched by our presence. So we bring presence, uh, not performance, you know, to allude to that earlier um, example. And so our intellect can just fall away and we, we naturally are able to be, just like uh, Sue Lynn said, you know, be curious and offer something perhaps that's... Um, even uh, feeds and, and nurtures that uh, that meeting of hearts and minds. And I, I thought, um, yeah, the uh, as I said, I didn't offer too much in the way of techniques, but just pointers, because I do think, you know, this is a collaborative sort of exercise. It's, um, but you know, when when we we do get on that learning curve to to listen more deeply, and you know, not just on the surface. Um, we listen with more of us, you know, with the ear of the heart, as I said. And, and what you do see in here is this, uh, this deeper potential within the human being in front of you. You see in here their, their well-being, their well of being. And, and that's what allows us to become collaborators. You know, we're, we're collaborators, fellow travellers in this, in this journey of growing in wisdom and understanding. And so I thought to finish... Um, uh, presentation just with a, a lovely poem by again it's referencing nature um, and uh, and it's full of metaphor um, and it was by American poet Mary Oliver and so it's called it was early um, it was early which has always been my hour to begin looking at the world and of course even in the darkness to begin listening into it especially under the pines where the owl lives and sometimes calls out as I walk by. As he did on this morning, so many gifts. What do they mean in the marshes where the pink light was just arriving? The mink with his bristled tail was stalking the soft-eared mice. And in the pines, the cones were heavy each one ordained to open. Sometimes I need only to stand wherever I am to be blessed. Little mink, let me watch you. Little mice, run and run. Deep pine cone, let me hold you as you open. Deep pine cone, let me hold you as you open. Okay, so thanks very much. Lovely to uh, share space with you and uh, 
I wish you best, all the best with your listening. Thank you so much, Matthew, for your generous sharing today. It's been a blessing being here in your presence today. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Jackie. Bye -bye. We've got a few final things before we finish up and I give you the link to be able to create a PD certificate if that's something that's important for you today and that'll also be available online in a couple of weeks. So just wanted to share a couple of final slides with you about some of the events that we've got coming up including the next free uh, event as well. The next um, paid event that we have is one called Playful Therapy for Children and Young People and the wonderful narrative therapist Kim Billington will be running this for us um, this week. We've also got an introduction to art therapy for clients of all ages that I'll be running over two nights this week. I've got a few places left in that. And next week, Dr Jodie Mullen, who's a fabulous uh, New York play therapist, is going to be doing a a three-hour training on managing child aggression in therapy if you're working with children. We've also got another free information evening coming up for the 2023 intakes for our graduate certificate in play and art therapy, which is a 200-hour, six-month course. And that next free night is the 30th of August, and you can register for that online if you're interested. Our next free event is called Midlife Reset and Ordinary Transformation. Um, and a very extraordinary woman uh, who's a great presenter is going to be sharing what has been an important change of life that she's experienced and some very practical things that she's done to transform um, post-menopause. So I'd highly recommend anyone who's going through that experience or living with anyone who might be to come on to that one because it's going to be very entertaining and practically informative. So when one person in just a moment is going to win this free webinar. So next week, Natalie McKenzie, who's our fabulous drama therapist, is going to be doing a webinar, not another icebreaker, engaging activities for starting groups. And that's both online and in person. That'll be run on the 5th of August. It's normally $50, but one person is going to win it now. We had a question in the chat that we didn't quite get to. And I know that many of you are very experienced clinicians and I think could possibly help answer this question. And the question that I'd like to pose, and one person is going to win this and the person who probably can type in faster than anybody else in the chat, what for you is one way that you set yourself up? It could be a skill that you exercise, it could be a practice that you do, prior to a counselling session to really put you in the best possible space to listen with your heart rather than your head. What's one skill that you might use to share with others around that? If you could pop that into the chat and as you see them coming in, have a read of those as well because some of those ideas are the rich sharing that we can give to each other in this online space. So here's some beautiful um, exercises and things that people are doing. But Alison, um, I think you were the quickest off the mark there. So <laughs> well done, Alison. I'll send you, I'll send you the link um, in a moment um, where you can access that, or if you're not able to, to perhaps gift it to a friend. But I'd like to thank you all for being here today. In the chat now, I'm going to put the link to the quiz that on successful completion will take you to a web address that you can cut and paste into your search engine, Google, or any other that you use that will take you to a page that will allow you to create your own PD certificate for today. So if you can copy and paste that little link I've just put into chat, that will take you to your, um, your quiz for today. And I'd like to thank you all for being here today. If anyone has any final questions or reflections, I'm happy to stay on board. If any of the chat that you did, the deeper talking or listening has stirred anything up and you want to have a bit of a debrief or chat about that, I'm here for the next 20 minutes. So happy to do that. But otherwise, thank you all very much for coming and look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks for being here, everybody. Bye now.